Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church and our contemporary worship service. I'm Sarah, the pastor here. We are so grateful to have you join us this morning. And as we are preparing ourselves and settling in, and whether we're here in the sanctuary, watching online or archived, let's take a moment and join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we are your people. You have claimed us and you have known us since before the day of our birth. And it has been a journey up until this point. And as we gather in new and inspiring ways to worship you, to form the body of Christ here in Crozet and beyond, we recognize that your spirit not only keeps us accountable, connects us to one another and you, but also equips us to do mighty acts of kindness and mercy in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So while we come here to turn over our burdens to you, while we come here to worship you and praise your name, we also gather here, Lord, to find out what you would have us say, do, and be next. Who will you have us manifest Christ as this week? As we go back out into our lives, as we will go back to our homes, into our neighborhoods, and encounter your people. We pray that you will give us all the inspiration that we need during this sacred time of worship to be the disciples that Jesus calls us to be and that so many in the world desperately need to experience. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we begin with our opening music. We're going to start with Here I Am to Worship. into darkness open my eyes let me
Let me put my mask back on. So now is the time in our worship service where we share our message for the day. I haven't even put the mask on yet with our kids. <laughs> and so I'm going to do that if they would like to come forward because I have some really cool things to show them. So if there are any children that want to come up here, you're welcome to do that. And I will show you some really cool things that I have up here. Ladies, you want to come join me up here? So today, the saint I want to talk to you about is not in our deck of cards, right? That deck of what we've had. So I had to find a way to show her to you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you first somebody that our saint really respected. This is St. Clair. And St. Clair started a group for people who wanted to be like St. Francis. Remember when we talked about St. Francis who loves the animals? St. Clair started a group for women and girls so that they could do it too because St. Francis had one for men and boys and St. Clair started one for girls. And this is a traditional style icon. They didn't have photographs so they couldn't take pictures with cameras and phones. So this is how they used to paint people. And you can tell she's a saint because she kind of has this halo. You see that there? And she's holding a scroll and her scroll says, place your mind before the mirror of eternity because she was also slightly mystical. So she had some kind of deep things to say and ponder. So this is St. Clair and she's dressed like a nun, right? This is one of the things that they used to wear for their religious order. And then I'm gonna show you this awesome saint that we're talking about today. This is St. Catherine of Bologna and she is the patron saint of artists. So do you see how this one looks different from this one? What does this one kind of look like? Does it look like it's a lot of different? Yeah, and it's a lot of pieces. Do you see it in there? Because this is a piece of art that is done by a woman named Sandy Schimmel Gold. She actually lives in Richmond here in Virginia, and she takes junk mail and makes mosaic art out of it. That is like the most redemptive thing I have ever heard about junk mail in my life. And so she took lots of junk mail and cut it all up and then made little tiles with it and made her depiction of St. Catherine. So St. Catherine was a nun like St. Clair, but she was really good at art. She could paint, she could draw, she could write poetry, she could play the viola, which is a slightly bigger stringed instrument than a violin. And she continues to be somebody that artists look to for inspiration. And that's why Sandy Schimmel Gold decided to make her in a piece of art. So this saint was inspired by this saint who inspired an artist. Isn't that kind of cool that our faith can do that? So the next time you're thinking, hey, how can I do something different? Think about St. Catherine because St. Catherine loved to figure out new ways to talk about God, to worship God, and to introduce God to people. And that is one of the great things about the church is that there's a place for all of that. So St. Catherine, St. Clair, and St. Clair was influenced by St. Francis. Do you start to see here we're all connected? Absolutely. And all of us were inspired by Jesus. So this is your lesson for today. And like I said, you're not going to find either of these two in your deck of cards. But you will find St. Francis who inspired her and then later her. Okay? All right. If you would like to go to children's worship, we've got Ms. Whitney and Ms. Laura who will take you. And we will see you back in a little while. Awesome. And so before I read our scripture text this morning, I'm going to give us an opportunity once more to let that Holy Spirit rain down before we hear our scripture. Let us pray. Come upon us once again, O Holy Spirit. Rain down not just your presence, but your blessing. Help us to be transformed by what we hear. To remember that we are connected through your presence and your movement with not just Christians here with us, and those that are streaming with us, but Christians through the ages. You have been upon the prophets. You were at work through the apostles. And you continue to connect all those who believe with our almighty God. And for this, we are grateful. 
May this reading of the word be what we need, for you know us better than we even know ourselves. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is going to come from the prophetic words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, who, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So one of the things about this text is that it's describing things that no ear has heard and no eye has seen. And for a lot of us, that's going to be a problem. If you're an auditory learner or you are a visual learner, finding out that there are things about God that we can't hear or see is problematic. Now, if you're more of an experiential learner or a kinetic learner, you might be okay. We might be able to find that. But for the rest of us, we're looking for an opportunity to truly understand and grow in wisdom. And that's where creativity becomes such a blessing. Because our world in Christianity is filled with images and gifts of artistic creativity that help those of us that need to hear, that help those of us that need to see, and even have gone farther to help those of us that need to do and actually be in an experience. And because of that, we are able to have a glimpse or even a grasp of what God is telling us, revealing to us, and calling us to be. And our saint for today is a saint who was excellent at helping people see, hear, and experience God in new and creative ways. And this is St. Catherine of Bologna. She was born in 1413, and she died in 1463. She's actually one of the older saints that we have talked about. And she is the patron saint of artists, as I mentioned. And here are just some of the things that are so amazing about her. She was considered to be a poor Claire nun. And so poor Claire nuns were those who were of the monastic tradition of Claire, St. Claire. And as I said, she was providing a place for female counterparts to Franciscans. So St. Francis was a, a huge inspiration upon St. Claire, and they were actually contemporaries. And so St. Claire founded an order that, like the Franciscans, is completely based in service to the poor. And because of that, that's what drew St. Catherine. At 13, she decided to pursue the monastic order. And as she did that, what she discovered was that there was a place for her unique gifts. A lot of people who go into the monastic traditions are working on their prayer life, they're working on their mission work, they are focused on learning the scriptures and following an order, usually a daily structure. And for Claire, she discovered that under I'm not Claire, but St. Catherine under the poor Claire nunnery, that she could find places to utilize the gifts of being a writer. She was a teacher. She was a mystic. And she was an artist as well as a musician. What she ended up doing was discovering ways in which she could use her gifts to help those not only within her monastery, but also those in the community. Since poor Claire nuns were like female Franciscans and focused upon helping the poor, they were often in places that lacked access to some of the finer arts. And so St. 
Catherine was able to share some of that. She was born into an aristocratic family, and as she was growing up, she became a lady-in-waiting to another woman who was very wealthy, and it was there in her court that she learned how to do things like read, write, paint, speak Latin, and play the viola. And because of this, she was exposed to a whole other lifestyle than the people that she would feel called to serve for the remainder of her life. And when she joined the monastery, the monastery was in a time of transition. And the monastery that she joined had been Augustinian. And they were debating whether or not they should become more Franciscan. And for those of us outside of the Catholic tradition, you're probably going, what? does that mean? Well, let me, let me share some of that with you. So every order, monastic order within not only Catholicism, but the Anglican Church and some other Protestant organizations have these understandings of monastic orders. And so you have the Augustinian order, and their emphasis is really on knowledge. They are very much derivative of divine knowledge and making sure that we understand and are producing works that explain or undergird theology and doctrine. And so so you will find Augustinians, they're, they're not as prolific as some of the others like Benedictines and Franciscans, but you will find Augustinians a lot of times around institutions of higher education. For instance, on the East Coast, if you would like to see some real live Augustinians, you can go to Villanova University outside of Philadelphia, and not only are they running a gorgeous chapel up there for the students and the faculty and the community, but they are also actively teaching college courses. And so they continue to do their work, not only to shepherd God's people, but also to provide them with the benefit of the education that is an essential part of being an Augustinian. And of course, they are named for St. Augustus. Then you have Franciscans who are named for St. Francis. And of course, the most notorious <laughs> Franciscans are those who often are barely clothed and out in the, uh, in the, po in the poverty-stricken areas in the world. So while you will find Augustinians, usually around places where you have universities and probably a higher socioeconomic status, you will often find Franciscans in some of the poorest areas in the poorest countries. And it's not that one is better than the other, but you can tell that they are reaching two totally different communities and focusing on different things. Franciscans, like St. Francis, are very much about serving the poor, assisting the poor, using all of their time and their energy to improve the lives of the impoverished communities in which they place themselves. And so St. Francis was very inspirational to St. Clair, as they shared with our children. And so St. Clair was able to found the, the kind of mirror image of the Franciscan monastic order with the order of St. Clair. And of course, hers is not called the order of St. Clair, it's called Poor Clair. We can talk about that another time. Poor Clair, and so those nuns often had the opportunity to do things that their male counterparts as Franciscan friars were doing. And they are very much so looking for ways to share the love of God with a people who sometimes wonder if they even have food when they get home. They wonder how they're going to feed their children. They wonder how they're even going to survive until the next paycheck. That is often the plight of the people that Franciscans and poor Clare nuns serve. And St. Catherine comes at the age of 13 into this monastery, and they're trying to figure out which direction they're going to go. Do we want to stay Augustinians, or do we want to transition more into this Franciscan thread? And ultimately, they do. They become more Franciscan, which means that they have to pivot and how they focus their energy, what they're doing with their work within their monastic community, but also to whom they are serving. They have to redirect all their effort and kind of do things in a whole new way. And St. Catherine quickly found a place to use her gifts. Not a lot of nuns were running around that day that could be so fluent in Latin. And you can see that she began her creativity with herself. We have her prayer book. A lot of monastic orders have an actual prayer book, an order that they use, a breviary. And she used to draw and do her own kind of calligraphy within hers. So if she had an order that was lifting up a prayer to St. Francis, then she would start to doodle this gorgeous St. Francis in her prayer book. And then she would embellish it over time. Then when you go back and look at it, it is just filled you know, from page end to page end with beautiful drawings and calligraphy, and she would add her own prayers in there. And this has been saved, and it is something that other 
not only nuns, but other Catholics and even other Christians find inspiring that there's a place for that. So if you were ever that kid in school that was doodling on your paper, you and St. Catherine would get along very well. She would very much appreciate that kind of outward expression. And she was also one who discovered that her music could be beneficial. We have long known in Western society that music is beautiful and it's celebratory and it can make us feel good. But what we also have learned from a number of traditions outside of Western civilization is that it can be religious and therapeutic that it can actually change the way you feel. And so St. Catherine used to play the viola not only for the impoverished people as they were coming to be fed or coming to receive the alms that had been collected, but she would use her viola to change the mood of the room that she was in. She could make it so that people felt more calm. You can also use the stringed instrument to ramp people up. She could do that if they wanted to have a really exciting experience with God because she was a mystic and she believed that God could be experience through mystical and incredible experiential ways of encountering God's word and worship. And so she would use her gift to do all of this. Now, I have some colleagues who are incredibly gifted in music and the arts, and I am slightly jealous, not to the point of coveting, I have tried to remove that from my life, but slightly jealous of their gifts. My cousin that I grew up with, I think she's about two years older than me, is a professional artist. She's actually a ceramics artist. So whenever I hear Potter's Hand, I'm like, oh, Cousin Jennifer. I get very excited about that. And sometimes throughout my life, I can fake art. You ever seen that where people who can kind of fake it a little bit? We only have like four or five things we do really well. You can't be like, draw me a tiger. I'd be like, that's not in my repertoire. But I can kind of fake art a little bit. And then people be like, oh, you're so artistic. And all I can think of is, you need to meet my cousin. My cousin is amazing, like you should see what she does. I know that I am an artistic poser. I am well aware of what I'm doing. But she is truly artistic. She can create out of nothing. I have to be inspired. And so she is just incredibly able to come from within, there's some kind of well within her and she's able to do this. So when I think of St. Catherine, I think of how I have witnessed that in my cousin Jennifer. And she is able to use her ceramics in a number of ways. I mean, you've seen people that just collect ceramics and they're like, this is beautiful, it's on display, it's like a 3D sculpture. But my cousin has also been able to make real world ceramics. She can make things, objects for worship, like chalices and bowls and pitchers. She can make mugs that people can drink out of or they can give to somebody. Imagine if you who said, I want to give something to somebody who is dying in a hospice and they need to know that I love them and I want it to be functional and practical so that they will use it every day instead of just sticking it in a cupboard. And so she would make these gorgeous mugs and she can paint them, she can do calligraphy on these mugs and even the way she glazes and fires her ceramics are inspirational. And I'm like, I bought you this pretty mug on Home Goods. It's like completely not the same. So art has a wonderful place in the life of the church. You are sitting here, if you're in our sanctuary, in a place where artistic expression is literally in the windows. Stained glass is a place of artistic expression. Because we are also a church that does some more traditional worship, you can see it expressed in our paraments, these hangings that are up here. You know, some of them are, are more simplistic, but some of them clearly represent an artistic eye. And the church values that. That's why the church, coming out of what's called the Dark Ages in Europe, was actually being a patron towards artists, asking them to compose musical work, asking them to paint the ceilings of their chapels, asking them to create all kinds of artwork that people who largely could not read, they were not literate, could look at and be inspired. You know, if you can't read the entire book of Genesis, maybe we can show you some scenes and you can at least be a little bit more aware of what's happening in there. The problem is that if you only look at one form of art, you kind of get dialed into that's the way it is. Now, these are all somebody's interpretations of key moments in the life of Jesus in our windows, and the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is Leonardo da Vinci's idea of what certain parts of Genesis look like. And that's fine as long as you realize that there are other ways of interpreting and drawing or painting or celebrating those texts. And that is one of the greatest gifts of art, is that it reminds us that there are a myriad of ways to experience God. But even more than that, there's a myriad of ways in which we can offer God. 
So art gives us a way of offering to somebody this pretty difficult text that I read you out of Isaiah. Isaiah is a long prophetic text. It includes prophetic word that came from before the Babylonian exile, in the midst of the Babylonian exile, and it's even post-exilic text. And all of that has come together in this very long prophetic book. And every now and then somebody's like, I'm going to read the prophets, and I'm going to start with Isaiah. And I'm like, let me know when you've given up on that, and I'll give you a shorter book. Come back and I'll give you a shorter book. Isaiah is definitely worth reading, don't get me wrong, but that's probably not a good place to start. It's a long book. And there's something rewarding about, hey, I finished Haggai in like two days. That's beautiful. So instead, we wanna look for opportunities where we can use our gifts and our creativity. And I have to tell you, over the weekend, I was looking at what our church has been doing, and I am amazed at the breadth of creativity that has been expressed in this church. It's like all of you have already been worshiping and being motivated by St. Catherine of Bologna. Like her spirit is upon you and you are at work because not only has our church gotten creative about how it's doing ministry for children and youth, but our church has gotten creative in other ways. So yesterday was the first day that Grace Grocery, our food mission here at our church, was able to do something that I thought was pretty amazing. Grace Grocery is truly an innovative and foundational mission work here in Crozet. And before the pandemic, every Monday afternoon, people could come here, whether they were documented or not, and they were able to shop as in a grocery store and get the things that they wanted. Some food pantries aren't like this. You come and they give you a set group of groceries. Whether you know how to soak and cook beans or not, that's what you were getting. But here at Grace Grocery, you can really tailor it. If somebody has a health issue like diabetes, we can make sure that we give them things that are better for them or things that they can um, cook that they readily know or we can talk to them about how to cook some of the things that they're interested in. That's a wonderful thing to give people who are struggling just to feed themselves, much less their families. And so Grace Grocery had done that consistently, serving up to 200 different households. Like it's incredible what they were able to do. And then on the third Saturday before the pandemic, we had a USDA distribution. Well, because this is part of the federal government, you couldn't be undocumented. You actually had to have a photo ID, a government issued photo ID that they could trace. So we were able to make sure that one way or another, we were serving different communities here within Crozet or people within Albemarle County that could come to our church. But our people weren't happy with the status quo. We're doing good things, but how can we do it better? So uh, yesterday, I was just so excited all day because some of our key volunteers at Grace Grocery had figured out how to get just incredible amounts of fresh food for our people. It's one thing to give somebody dry goods and canned goods, but you and I both know that every now and then you need something that was actually alive and not pickled. You need something alive. And so they reached out to find a great source for fresh food. So yesterday, would you like to know how we stocked Grace Grocery? Wegmans. Wegmans. That just says about the level of commitment and how they feel about the dignity of the people that come here. If some of us are going to shop at Wegmans because we think that that's best, then we should be willing to shop there for them. And I was just so excited over that. And I had nothing to do with it. That was entirely God at work through people just like you and me. And that's amazing. People who have figured out, you know what, we're going to figure out how to get kids together. We're going to teach them not only how to be connected to each other, but the plans moving forward include connecting our kids in the Children's Fellowship with some of our fellow neighbors at the old trail, the Lodge at Old Trail. Cross-generational connection. I didn't come up with that, but that's amazing. And so what we discover is that when you don't feel limited or you feel like, you know what, I can try something crazy and if it doesn't work, it's okay, then people will think outside the box and they will come up with creative ways, not just to learn about our faith and grow in our faith, but connect us to other people, people who really need to know. I was over at the lodge this past week because there is a member of our family of faith who is actively dying. And while I was going in and out last week, I had the opportunity to see other people And as I see those people, they would say to me, are you the pastor at Crozet United Methodist Church? Yes. Sometimes that's obvious. Yes, I am. And they would talk about how they had interacted with people at our church or they had interacted with the missions and the ministries of our church or how they had come here for a funeral and the reception that they received and the way that they were welcomed. 
And that is because God has found creative ways to be at work through this family of faith. And that is a beautiful thing. Now, some people, they want to go to a museum and they want to look at beautiful art and they want to have some contemplative moments and they want to ponder and take it all in. And that is a beautiful thing. Some people, they want to have their entire being overwhelmed with sound and sight, like concerts and being in the midst of a bunch of people. And that too is a beautiful thing. But perhaps the most beautiful thing that we as Christians have to consistently offer to the world is connection and relationship. And people here at Crozet, outside of our family of faith, have been experiencing that. They have been experiencing the creative ways our people, our small groups, our missions, and our ministries are looking to expand the connection. How can we help you? What can we do that will be of service to you? And day by day, people are figuring out that when they are in need or when they are lonely or when they just feel like they need something more in their lives because there's a God-shaped hole in all of us, they come here. And they come here because of you, God at work through you. And that is something that requires some creativity. A lot about leading in the church isn't necessarily you have an MBA. It isn't about, I know, back and forwards, Robert's Rules of Order, and I can run a committee. That is not what leadership is about. Leadership is about risk. Leadership is about being willing to step out onto those waters and not know whether or not you're going to fall below. But because we are Christians, we believe, because we have read, and some of us have actually seen, that when you are willing and faith to walk out on those waters, when you start to slip below, Jesus will grab you. And you might start to fall, but you are not going to hit rock bottom. And failure, because you are trying to be a good Christian, is always an acceptable risk. That is something that, as a church, coming out of a pandemic and going back into a world that doesn't know what normal is really going to be, this is when it, we need that kind of spirituality. We need people who say, you know what? This sounds crazy. That's the best thing you can ever say to me. Guess what? This sounds crazy. Give it to me. I want to hear it. Because even if it sounds crazy, is that not who we are? We're a people who are born of a faith that came from a God who decided to come to us in this and then decided that God would love all people, not just the ones that loved God, but God would love all people so much that God would offer God's self on the Roman equivalent of an electric chair. And that anybody who wanted to be saved from their guilt and their sin, their mistakes, that they could do it. Not by having to have penitence and not by having to flagellate yourself, not by having to turn over everything you have, but simply by giving your heart to God. That's a crazy idea. And I could phrase it in a way that doesn't sound so crazy, but I could also phrase it in a way that sounds even crazier. That back in the first century, a Judean Jew decided that an entire existence of humanity was worth forgiving. That's crazy. That's an insane idea. Why would you want to forgive people who are already dead, people who are currently dying, and people who haven't even been born yet? Why would you want to do that? Because if you've studied human history, you know how depraved humanity can be. But if you have been in the church, you also know how glorious humanity can be. And that's what God is doing. God is giving us all a chance to lean into those ideas that seem crazy. This seems ludicrous. One day, some people in our church said, you know what? Our people who come here, and they call them the clients, the clients who come to Grace Grocery, they deserve the very best that we can do. And what can we do for them? And they figured out, and they went out, and they made a connection at Wegmans, and they figured out how to connect our church and how to pick it up and what to do with it. And then as I was talking to them this week, I said, well, what happens if we get too much food? What do we do with that? They already had plan B and C. We're going to send some of it over to the ark. We'll send some of it over here. It is not going to go to waste. We are going to make sure that people are fed until all of it is gone. And that is the exact kind of inspiration that St. Catherine was trying to give to the world. 
She was trying to let people say, yes, I am a traditional artist. She could paint, she could draw, she could write poetry. She could write psalms. She could play the viola. She could do all of those things that a lot of us can't do, much less two or three or all of them. But what she also figured out is you can be creative. She was also an abbess. She was in charge of the abbey before she died. And she had risen to that place, not because she had been through some kind of Vatican training program for leadership. She had risen to that place because people watched time and time again as she found creative ways to solve problems. There were plenty of nuns that knew doctrine and theology. There were plenty of nuns that knew how to go out and, and beg for alms or get food to the poor. There were plenty of nuns that knew how to do that. But they needed somebody to inspire them and to believe in them. And the church is about that. Churches will stagnate and die if you think that all of the inspiration has to come through a single person, especially if you think that person is standing in this type of area. Where the movement of the Spirit is, is out there. It's out there. And sometimes you just need to have somebody up here go, you know what, that's a great idea. What do you need? How can we help you do that? And help to connect. You know, we have a staff member who had contact with the local public schools and found out that there were people who were showing up to pick their children up at school and saying to the guidance counselors, we have no food at home. It's the end of the school day and we have no food. And so the guidance counselors started to have a conversation with our staff person and say, don't you have a food pantry? Yes, we have Grace Grocery. Well, is there any way that we could get some of those bags and keep them here? Like we could get some of that food and then if somebody needs it in an emergency, we could give it to them? Absolutely. So the volunteers of Grace Grocery packed up nine bags, which were specifically attuned to the kinds of things that kids will eat. And then they are going to go over to the nine guidance counselors in our local public schools. And within every bag will be a flyer. And the flyer has English on one side and it's being translated into Spanish on the other. So that when a family gets that and it says, this is for you and if you need more, here's where to come. And there are people that will help you. None of that had anything to do with me. That was purely God in you. And there are even bigger and better things that are on the horizon for Crozet. But if you stop yourself and you go, this idea is crazy, or I don't even know how we're going to make it happen. I don't even know if anybody's going to want to do this. If you stop yourself, if you truncate your own exploration, then it'll never happen. So if St. Catherine can inspire anything, perhaps it's, let's try something we've never tried before. Let's do something that seems really crazy. You can actually teach people how to build a community of fellowship and faith by doing insane amount of, like, games. Yes, you can. Because I see it in our youth. And who thought live-action Mario Kart was of Jesus? If you had told me that human curling could actually foster a relationship, I would have told you that it sounds like a liability nightmare. Thank God you don't have to run everything through me. But because God is at work creatively doing things, how can we take this and push it? How can we make this meaningful? Then the world is blessed. And we are blessed to be a part of it. Don't you want to be a part of a church that really does make a difference in people's lives? I've been members of churches that had gorgeous sanctuaries. I've been a member of churches that had incredible music programs. And those are wonderful things. Everybody loves a gorgeous sanctuary and everybody loves a beautiful music program. But if you don't think about what else we can be and do, then what are we? We're a one-stop Sunday shop. But not at this church. This church this past week was busy seven days. Our preschool ministry was going Monday through Friday, concurrent with the ministries that our staff are administering that were here. 
concurrent with the food pantry that was open on Monday. And then that food pantry came back and Grace Grocery was at work on Saturday in prep for tomorrow. Seven days a week. That's the kind of savior I want to serve, somebody who's open seven days a week. And when people find out that you can always find Jesus here, that is the the future. That is what the future is. Because Sunday mornings are getting hard for people. Sunday mornings are getting hard. But Jesus finds a way. When the Pharisees told Jesus, you can't come in the synagogues anymore, Jesus said, that's fine. I'll go hang out at the well. I got news for you. More people show up at the well than they do the synagogue. So that's where he hung out. He figured out ways to find the people that needed him. And that's why when you hear names like Franciscans, when you hear names like Augustinians, they are named after a person, but that person's entire existence is about making Jesus acceptable and making Jesus accessible. How do you show Jesus in a way that people go, you know what, I need to know him. I need to know him, and I want to know people that know him. How do you do that? And the best part of asking that question is that I don't have the answer. I know who does. And I know that over the next few days, weeks, and months, I'm going to get to hear that answer, and I'm going to get to hear it through you. And that is the best example of a living church that I can give you. A church that is constantly looking for how to do Jesus, love, and grace better. And if that sounds like a good fit for you, you are already in the right place. And if you know somebody who has gifts and you think, you know what, we got to figure out how to connect those gifts with Jesus, then that's where the church can help you. But as far as how to bless other people, you have all the inspiration you need. God has given you everything. And when you choose in your moment and in your time to step out on faith onto those waters and you wonder whether there's a storm waiting or whether there's some chasm below, don't forget to keep your eye on Jesus. You will never fall below the waters. You will never fall totally fail because God is with you and we are for you. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. So now is the time in our worship service when we worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings and I've already shared with you some of the amazing things that we're doing at this church but that happens because of your giving. So thank you for even considering being a part of the financing of the incredible things that God is doing here. Let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you provide for us everything that we need. We are a people who abound in blessing. But because of this holy truth, we know that we need to provide for others. Not only connection and relationship, but sometimes, Lord, there are people that are desperately in need. And so like the many saints that have come before us, may we be inspired to act. We do not know where these gifts will go or the lives that they will touch. We know one holy truth. 
those lives are yours. And we seek to bless them as we have been blessed. May it be so. Through the missions and the ministries inspired by Jesus Christ, through the work of the church and the relationships that are knitted together by the Holy Spirit, and by all of this that is overseen by God the Father, may it be done, for this is your will and your way. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. I have a lot of actual things to tell you that are going on here. Um, the first is that we announced this week that our preschool director, Amy David, who is a church member, is going to be stepping down as of June 30th from this position um, for health reasons. And so she's going to see out this school year for us. But uh, I want to tell you this because not only are our families and our staff aware of this in the preschool, and this is a small community, but we're going to be advertising this position on Indeed Monday. So if you know somebody who might want to be a part of this program or you yourself might want to be a part of this program, we encourage you to take a look at it and begin that discernment process. We are so grateful for all that Amy has done. She stepped in as the interim director during a time of transition. She has been an incredible preschool director. She has overseen the, all the staff that were working toward one of the greatest outward acknowledgments of our preschool, which is that we were the number one preschool in Charlottesville. And that was happening during a pandemic. And so we are just grateful for all that she has done and we want to commend her for that work, want to be in prayer for who will follow in her footsteps and continue to build upon what she has done. But it has been a, a true blessing to have her overseeing that program for how passionate and invested she is, not only in our preschool ministry, but in our families and especially our children. And so I do wanna offer a blessing for this. Will you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks for Amy David and all that she has done for our preschool ministry and our church. We give thanks for the ways in which she embodies that call from Jesus Christ to let the children come to you. And that she strives for excellence so that our children will be blessed. They will experience community, grace, and the beginning of pursuing divine wisdom. And so they will grow into an incredible adulthood where they will bless countless others. But Lord, we also pray that she will find the rest and the healing that she needs. And we pray that you are already at work to send the next director to our school who will continue the good work that Amy has begun and who will build upon her level the next phase of our school and its ministries. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our middle, school, our middle school youth are getting ready to do ultimate musical chairs. <laughs> so uh, they had a one-week break last week, and now they're coming back. You can meet in the fellowship hall, and if you have a bike helmet, we recommend coming equipped. <sighs> okay, um, yes, bike helmets are good. What are we doing? Okay, snacks are going to be provided. Uh, students have any items they want to donate for those emergency food bags I talked about for the local schools, then they're going to build those out. Um, and we can definitely be collecting that project through the week in the next couple of weeks. So even if, if a youth doesn't come this week and do it, they can bring it in the next weeks. And they're going to be coordinating that. So now our youth are going to be working with Grace Grocery that are going to be working with the public schools. So if you have any questions, you can email Bart at youth at CruzeUnitedMethodist.org. And then again, we're still working to Award, um, monumental v Vacation Bible School. We're looking for those volunteers. The registration is open. We cannot wait to have our first Vacation Bible School in two years due to the pandemic. It's going to run June 27th through July 1st. And if you've signed up to help or you're interested, our, the first VBS meeting is going to be held on Sunday, February 27th after the 11 o'clock traditional worship service. It'll be a luncheon in the fellowship hall. You'll have the opportunity to see where you feel called or, or where your gifts are most suited. Uh, you can meet the other volunteers and really start to get cracking on this incredible opportunity to serve the children of our community. So if you have questions or you want to volunteer, you can talk to Whitney, and her email address is Crows, uh, children at crozetunitedmethodist.org. And if you would like to come to the luncheon and want to help out by RSVPing to Whitney, please do that by February 20th. And the last is that we want to remind you that the time is ticking to be a part of our dynamic donut fundraiser. So um, we are reinvigorating something that we did last year because of the pandemic, which was to find a way to 
engage in that traditional idea of using up the flour, the butter, the eggs, and the sugar, which we usually used in pancakes, but we're not going to be able to do that this year. We're still working through how to bring that back where we used to serve 200 people pancakes on Shrove Tuesday. But you can get donuts, and at the same time, you can help our preschool. You can order online. You pre-order them, plain or a chocolate dozen, or, and or, you can do the dynamic duo pack. has a math game, two donuts, and some fun donut swag that I through in there. So it should be fun. And you can do that. You can bless another family. Uh, I know that I'm buying a dozen and I'm going to eat one and give the others to my parents. They don't know that yet, but that'll be great. So you can do that. You can also donate it and like take it to the, um, the volunteer fire department. You can take it to a neighbor. You can take it somewhere where somebody will be blessed, whatever you want to do. Uh, look for opportunities to get creative and bless people as we are working toward Lent. It's hard to believe. Um, pick up for that is going to be on Tuesday, March 1st. That is Shrove Tuesday and Lent starts March 2nd. So thank you for everybody who's a part of making these uh, ministries and mission projects work and keeping us connected. The more we have these cross ministerial and missional connections, the more effective we are as a church. So if you see something and you think we can push it further, let us know. We want to figure out how to continue to just knit the fabric of our church together so that we can blanket Crozet and beyond. And because we are so grateful for all that you are and all that you've done, we're going to invite you to stand as you are able and join us in singing our closing song, The Potter's Hand.
you joined us for worship today, for you are the best part of being part of Crozet United Methodist Church. Will you receive this blessing? Repeatedly in the scriptures, it says, do not fear. Do not fear that sin will always follow you. Do not fear that you cannot be forgiven. Do not fear the future. But do not fear what God can do through you. Embrace your creativity and be inspired to bless this world in new and innovative ways. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. Amen. Take me, oh.